the Houston Philosophical Society at Rice University. At the opening of the Rice Institute in 1912, now Rice University, its first president, Edgar Odell Lovett, made clear its obligation to spread new learning in literature, science, and arts to the citizens of Houston, not just its enrolled students. That goal was extended in January 1920 when several faculty members organized the Houston Philosophical Society to bring together monthly faculty and civic leaders in science, medicine, the law, and humanistic disciplines for dinners and for lectures on the newest developments in those fields and others. Today, this organization continues to serve as a knowledge accelerator. It brings the latest ideas and discoveries to an intellectually curious membership through the form of popular and accessible lectures. Since 1927, the Society has met at the Cohen House Faculty Club on the Rice University campus, and it still reaches out to the broader Houston community and its various academic institutions for new members who are excited about sharing innovative ideas across the spectrum of professions and learned disciplines. This Town Gown Society sought to engage both academic leaders and various civic leaders in exploring the world of ideas, the thought being that such interaction could enrich the lives of all participants. For over a century, these meetings have expanded friendships and broadened the perspectives of the members of the Houston Philosophical Society. So just a little bit about Leonardo. He's a professor of civil and environmental engineering, I guess, of the structural ilk. At Rice, he obtained his master's degree from MIT and a PhD from Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, and he develops analytical and computational methods, including quantum classical optimization algorithms for the performance assessment of structural and infrastructure systems and their upkeep decision support. <laughs> but I'm going to make it. But here's what I love. Like, here's what that's really talking about. His team frequently interacts with statisticians, applied mathematicians, electrical engineers, computer scientists, and political scientists to address fundamental infrastructure problems of practical importance. And we all care about practical importance and bringing brilliant minds to solving practical issues. And so I think you're going to recognize some of these uh, that I'm about to read. Mm -hmm. Current multidisciplinary collaborations in the context of infrastructure mm -hmm. systems include the time-dependent reliability assessment of mm -hmm. power systems mm -hmm. at the distribution level, the coupling strength mm -hmm. quantification across utility systems uh, based on an offshore earthquake in Chile, Chile, and the topology assessment of water distribution networks. We've had some fun with that recently for the city of Houston, and last but not least, the evacuation behavior of risk averse Houston citizens under hurricane hazards. So, um, thank you for the work you're doing to make all of our lives better, and thank you for introducing um, President. I appreciate the introduction and it's uh, very exciting to see this vibrant community conversation could be as exciting as, as, as I have thought before. Um, uh, I appreciate the introduction. So I'll give some uh, formal remarks. The Office of the President uh, has some uh, prepared uh, words already, but I will add them my own. 
So let me start with the following. Um, some of you might have attended the investiture of uh, President Rush uh, last year, and Ruth Simmons, she had a peculiar ask to all of us. Speak French when you pronounce it last time. So I'm going to try that. <laughs> Dr. De Hoge became the eighth president of Rice University on July 1st of last year. Uh, he was also the provost uh, of the university, and before that, the dean of the School of Engineering in 2017. Mm -hmm. He's also a professor of our Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He's a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. He has a degree in Mechanical Engineering. And um, he, as the president of our university, he's the chief executive officer. He oversees about 8,000 students, eight academic schools, spanning all uh, endeavors of, of research, and about 1,000 of us faculty. Professor De Roche, um, has many, many interests in earthquake engineering, and in particular in the recent years on the resilience of infrastructure systems under extreme loads like earthquakes or hurricanes, and the application of smart materials. I will mention a little bit of that in the, after the official remarks. Uh, part of his academic record, he has approximately 300 scientific papers in the field of earthquake engineering disaster resilience. He has delivered more than 100 uh, technical talks in about 30 countries around the world. <laughs> And he has directed the PhD thesis of at least 10 uh, students and many more as part of his PhD committee. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, a big fraction of all of us have really pursued uh, careers in academia or are in uh, prominent positions in engineering firms, inspired by many of his teachings. Um, recent accolades uh, for uh, President Roche, uh, he's member of the National Academy of Engineering. And he was uh, essentially uh, inducted because people recognize the distinctive research he does that is innovative and that it has an impact on society. Uh, as part of more recent um, sort of uh, accolades as well, he's a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers, the Structural Engineering Institute of the American Society of Civil Engineers, and he has been awarded several distinguished uh, lecturers um, in, in the past year before the pandemic including the Distinguished Arnold Pearl Lecture Award in 2019, the John Bloom Distinguished Lecture Award in 2018, and also in 2018, the Distinguished Lecture of the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute. This last one is one of the most prominent uh, awards. It's very uh, highly regarded. It's the, among the highest honors in the field of earthquake engineering. Also, he's a distinguished, uh, distinguished member um, of the Alumni Society of Civil Engineering of the University of California, Berkeley, and an honorary alumnus of the Georgia Institute of Technology. So, as part of the research that I mentioned, I'm going to bring a little bit more. Dr. De Roche was the instructor of record of earthquake engineering at Georgia Tech. So, he taught us all the lessons that we need to know for not seeing disasters that we saw uh, 10 days ago. So this is timely, we, we know what to do, we know that uh, fragile structures will not withstand these kinds of earthquakes, but we also know that ductile structures like the ones he has researched with energy dissipation devices and smart materials that remember their shape and they can recover after the fight, they can be used to protect lives and, and communities. So he had been very inspiring. He had the smallest office in our uh, engineering building. He was assistant professor. It was him and maybe one or two students. <laughs> Um, but he always was uh, candid and eager to talk to us and inspire. So he not only talked, he wanted to keep the energy and the inspiration of us. So he took a group of about 20 uh, aspiring earthquake engineering researchers from the US to Japan in 2004 to show us the latest research labs there that were capable of shaping a building of a five story uh, structure, not to scale, but one one scale in machines that are able to reproduce earthquakes. These are pumps and actuators, and nothing more inspiring than to see that you know and that the technology and the innovation can really lead to saving lives and, and getting better communities. So I think all of us in that trip became uh, either professors or earthquake engineers, scientists in one way or another. And, and Reddy not only did that, so it's the teaching, the research, the inspiration. But he wants to follow up. So we initiated our careers, and in every professional conference, the only 
senior professor who will take the time to send an email and gather the newly minted assistant professors and PhD students was great. He got us for dinner, or drinks before, or drinks after, or both. <laughs> uh, or, or if that didn't work out, then uh, he will uh, get us to run in the next morning before breakfast. <laughs> so what I see now in retrospect is he was always trying to have this opportunity for a touch point, to follow up with people, to make sure that we are uh, seeing how the, the world works in this uh, academia. And uh, so we are very appreciative of that. Um, I reflect that all this uh, drag he has for uh, professionalism, for uh, research, and for uh, people only leads to one logical concept, becoming president of a research university. <laughs> so we are very happy that he became the president of Rice University. And with that, let's welcome uh, Reggie DeMosh to tell us about the higher education. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Leonardo. Um, it seems like just yesterday we were having drinks at, at a conference before and after the conference. Uh, that's really one of the reasons I got into the profession is because of the incredible students like Leonardo and many others that I had the fortune of working with uh, throughout my career. So, uh, thank you for being an inspiration, and you've been an inspiration to many students I know. Here at Rice. So uh, I am a respiratory engineer, and if you had told me just 10 years ago I'd be talking to the Philosophical Society of Houston as a civil engineer, as a, uh, some people call them beam busters, but this is what we do is we bust beams and figure out how we can make them stronger, I'd say no way. So it's really, uh, it is an honor to be here among so many friends, colleagues I've got to know at, at, at Rice and in the community. So uh, thank you for being here. So. What I want to do, and this is the first time I'm, I'm sort of doing this as we're beginning the strategic planning process for the university for the next year of Rice, is to give you a little bit of a snapshot about what we're thinking about. We're going through an official process now, but to give you a sense of, of where higher education is and where we think uh, Rice can go as a university. And I took a long time to figure out what the title of this, and we came up with Protect and Enhance evolving the university while building on our strengths. And the reason is we're going to protect what makes Rice special. And it really didn't take me very long to be at Rice. I got here in 2017 at the end of engineering to realize how unique this place is uh, as an institution, how we treat our students differently from anywhere else in the world that I've seen, and how we educate our undergraduates in a very special way. So we will protect that. At the same time, there are things that we need to enhance about the university. So we have to evolve the university uh, to go where higher education is going. So this is what I'll talk about. Uh, I'll sort of stay in the theme of protected and enhance uh, our university. <coughs> All right. So undergraduate programs. Everybody, most of our uh, alumni base were undergraduates at Rice because we didn't have uh, graduate programs for many years. And we have an incredible undergraduate. By all measures, I think our undergraduates are the best in the nation. And I've told people that, and I hear that from people that recruit students from Rice, uh, whether they're in industry or whether they're uh, going to graduate school. They always say Rice students are the best that outperform an MIT student or a Stanford student. Uh, your students are great. I do believe that we do a great job of preparing our students uh, for the future. Um, other people believe it also. And these are a variety of different rankings. Not that we're driven by rankings, but you can see here we are. <coughs> Consistently considered among the best, whether it's undergraduate teaching, and I see some of our great faculty in the classroom right here in the, in the audience, or um, best uh, quality of life, uh, where, where our students are considered amongst the happiest students on campus, and I see them all the time. They look very happy. And, uh, <laughs> and so it, it really, we do a great job at the undergraduate level preparing our students uh, for the future, and many of the rankings bear that out. Um, here we see the class of uh, fall incoming class of 2022, the graduates of, of 2026, to get a sense of you know, the competition, the competitiveness of uh, the Rice student. We received over 31,000 applicants for the entry class of 1,200 students this past fall. 
um, and we had a, a, a highest, our lowest admit rate, our highest yield rate. One of the reasons that we are expanding the, the university from 4,000 to 4,800, many of you who are alums will probably remember that we had 1,000 in the graduation where we are going to the university, it's because we get so many exception, exceptional applicants to Rice, we turn away kids that should be at Rice, and we know can be successful at Rice, and so we are, we will expand and grow the university, and we really do get uh, exceptional kids. Our SAT scores are amongst the highest in the nation. Our kids come in with an average of 26 AP credits uh, on average. Some one came with 76 AP credits. I'm not exactly sure how to get 76 AP credits. Um, but you know, we, we certainly get uh, students that are, that are exceptional. And now we're thinking about what does a future student look like? How do we prepare our students even better? For the future, and that, that has to do with being more well rounded. How do we make sure our students are graduating not just being smart, but being leaders, understanding the complexity of the world, being great communicators? Uh, and so, we're, we're embarking on, on a process to revise for the first time in 20 years our general education uh, program at Rice and what that might look like. How do we prepare our students for a future that's extremely uncertain? and will be very different from the future of the kids that are graduating uh, today. So we're, we're in that process now, so I'm gonna take two or three years, but we know we have to prepare our students differently uh, for the challenges, the many challenges that we know are ahead uh, for this next generation. The other thing that's happening, uh, particularly you see this at Rice, you see this around the, the world, is particularly at Rice, if you look at the trend, we've gone from an institution that was primarily focused on undergraduates to one where in three years, we will have more graduate students at Rice than undergraduates. And if people, you tell somebody that 10 years ago, they'd say, no way, because Rice has traditionally been an undergraduate focused institution. Uh, we obviously have one professional graduate program. We have graduate programs across the, the campus, but we have one school that's been focused on graduate programming, which is the business school, and, and we have graduates uh, across the board. And increasingly, the reputation of universities are really guided by the quality of graduate programs and the quality of graduate students that you can attract. So this is one area that uh, I believe Rice has the opportunity to improve upon moving forward. And in fact, uh, I know John Bowles is here, so he might correct me, but I, I, was, I was preparing for my uh, for the inauguration. I was reading about past presidents, and I remember uh, President Pritzker, who I believe was a fourth, or was he the fifth? Uh, I'll say fourth. I'll say, I think I've been right, fourth, uh, who came from Berkeley, and he said this is an incredible institution. The next phase for Rice is to have graduate programs that are of the same distinction as our undergraduate programs. This was 50 years ago, right? The late 60s, early 70s. That was his mandate to the university. And, and, and I don't think he quite got to where he wanted to he left before he did that to become uh, president of Stanford. but. That was his vision for Rice. He realized how exceptional we were at the undergraduate level. He came from an institution that had both strong undergraduate and graduate programs. He said, that's the future of the university here at Rice, and that was his mandate. I would say that is, again, still where we need to take Rice is to have graduate programs that are the same distinction as our undergraduate programs across the breadth of the university, not just in the STEM fields, but across the breadth of the university. And that is largely based on the scholarship and the research that our faculty would do at the university. And so when we think about that and why that's important, so oftentimes when I'm talking to alums, they're concerned. Well, if you're gonna, if you're gonna try to get really strong graduate programs, are you gonna harm the precious undergraduate experience that Bryce is well known for? And I say just the opposite. By having strong graduate programs, you're actually gonna to improve the undergraduate experience. So, in a place like Rice, where 70% of our students work with, uh, do research, whether they're in the humanities or in, the, or in engineering or sciences, more than two thirds of our students participate in research uh, with, uh, with their faculty member. Most of the time, it's going to be spent with their graduate students in their lab, not with their faculty member. My daughter does research with a very famous uh, bioengineer here at Rice. And she meets with them perhaps once every couple of weeks, but she's in there for hours every day with a graduate student in that lab working. And so having stronger graduate students and graduate programs will enhance our undergraduate experience here at Rice. So 
So how do we make that happen? Certainly, certainly it's about building uh, stronger scholarship and research programs across the breadth of the university. And I like to use this because it's easy to remember. It's about the, the, the five P's. It's about purpose, about the people, about the places they work, uh, the partnerships we build, and the programs that we have to support them. And so let me go through these uh, in a second. It's about solving the world's most pressing challenges, creating new knowledge in a variety of ways, recruiting really top-notch faculty, and, and retaining, keeping the young stars that we have at Rice, and making sure they don't leave Rice for another university, making sure we have the right infrastructure for people to do that work, whether they're in architecture or in engineering. We have to have the right spaces for them. Having the right partnerships, uh, and we're in a place that there are unique opportunities to have incredible partnerships here in the city of Houston and at Rice. And then making sure we're supporting the scholarship and research that our faculty do. And this is just an example of some of the areas where uh, we know we're going to work, including energy and climate, perhaps the most challenging problem of our time. How do we put the entire breadth of the university, every, every field will contribute to solving the problem of energy and climate. The built environment, which is housing architecture, the engineering technologies that come out of uh, new energy. It's going to be a problem that needs to be solved with the breadth of the university. Health and medicine, being across the street from the largest medical center, provides us the opportunity to really be a major player in the future of health and medicine. Looking at disparities in a variety of ways anchored by our Kinder Institute, and how AI and computing and quantum is absolutely changing everything around the world and understanding the implications of those changes. And then recruiting top-notch faculty. This is the core of who we are as a university, how we create new knowledge, how we inspire our students by having great superstars, bringing them here to Rice and giving them everything they need to succeed them. So a snapshot here of Naomi Howes, Rebecca Richard Corum, two of our engineering faculty who have been here uh, for, for many years, uh, who are both university professors, the highest distinction uh, that you can have at Rice. And P.C. Lamont, who we just recently recruited, who just received the prestigious MacArthur Genius Prize uh, in English. And then uh, Ramothi Ramesh, who uh, was also just hired to be Vice President of Research from Berkeley, who's a member of the National Academy of uh, Engineering, and recently got inducted to the National Academy of Inventors. We need to continue to bring superstar talent to, to Rice. One of the things that I announced during the inauguration is as we grow the undergraduate student body, we're committed to maintaining that small ratio of student to faculty, student to faculty ratio of roughly six to one, which means that we will add around 200 faculty to the university in the next five years. Think of that, for a place like Rice to add 200 faculty, how we can absolutely transform the university by bringing in talent across the breadth of the spectrum, young talent, more experienced talent. We really can change the university by recruiting great talent here, we're going to be committed to doing that, and keeping our young talent. So this past year, we had 13 of our junior faculty, 13 received what's called an NSF Career Award. These are awards for uh, faculty at the early stage of their career, typically within uh, six years of them starting their career. Not a single university in the country, as small as we are, and we're one of the smallest, had more career winners than Rice which speaks to the quality of the young faculty that we've been able to recruit to Rice. And our challenge is going to be keeping them, because I guarantee you every university is going to come after these young faculty, and we have to work hard to make sure we provide them with the environment uh, where they're, they're successful, but they're also uh, feeling like they're supported here at Rice. And then we have to have great infrastructure. And infrastructure, when people think of infrastructure, they think of engineering and science buildings. You're an engineer, all you care about is that, and I show them new O'Connor building on the lower right, but we also have the new Rocket Hall for Opera, which is going to transform our music school and our opera program. We're renovating, thanks to, to Will Watch, the here Kennedy, Kennedy Hall, which is going to transform and enhance an already amazing program in architecture. The Craft Hall for Sciences, which is uh, which is a house as much about social science, social science program, which is an area that's uh, growing rapidly in terms of student interest. We have to maintain strong infrastructure uh, strong labs, both to recruit people, but also to provide them with the environment where they can be successful and thrive uh, in this space. And then we have to have strategic partnerships. One of the things, one of the challenges 
that rice had is we are small. We are absolutely amongst the smallest of our peer group in terms of the number of students, the number of faculty. We are small, so we have to have strategic partnership to be successful. First, we have to work collaboratively as a university. We can't work in silos. We can't afford to work in silos because we're too small. But we also have to leverage the uniqueness that we have here in the city of Houston. And that includes the city of Houston providing an incredible living laboratory, the Texas Medical Center. I know there are many of you here from the Medical Center. We've worked really hard, I've worked really hard to forge stronger relationships with the institutions in the Medical Center. We absolutely have to be able to be successful as a university. The energy, uh, we're the energy capital of the world. Houston is positioning itself to be the energy transition capital of the world. Rice has to lead that charge. There's no other place that can lead that charge but rice. And of course, uh, we still are the space capital of the world. So we have these unique assets that nobody else has. Nobody has assets like this in the area so close to the university. We have to, we really have to leverage those for us to be successful. And we have to continue to support scholarship and the research that our faculty are doing. That takes a variety of forms, whether it's releasing teaching or um, uh, providing staff. We have to figure out how we support this so that our faculty can have an impact on the world. And we need to be a global university. Um, we, we embark on global work. Our School of Architecture probably has the strongest global presence because of John right here, we 20 something years ago, uh, started bringing our architecture students to Paris uh, and, and has really created an incredible program for, for our architecture students. But we need to do something like that across the breadth of the university. We, we're just not quite we don't have the global visibility that a university like Rice should have. And so we're embarking on a process now to, to really understand where we should be in addition to Paris, where should we have a global presence, how do we get more of our students abroad. We probably have one of the lowest percentages of our students going abroad. Um, people say it's because our students are so happy they don't want to leave campus. I'm not sure if I believe that. Uh, but we do need to get our students uh, studying abroad, how do we form strategic partnership that will enhance uh, our faculty's work and scholarship, and how do we become a pipeline for students to come uh, to come to rights. And so we're, we're embarking on that process right now to figure out what the right strategy is for a place like, uh, like Rice University. So as I mentioned, we've begun a strategic planning process. We have a, a committee of faculty, staff, students, alumni that are part of that. Um, the goal is to articulate our vision uh, for the next 10 years for the university, how we will evolve uh, and change and take the university to a next level of excellence. Uh, and I'm very excited about uh, where we are and, and how that process is going and hope to have something um, tangible by, by December time frame, roughly, uh, in time to be approved by the Board of Trustees and, and launched about a year from now, next, next January. We always remain uh, focused on our values, uh, both the RICE, R-I-C values, responsibility, integrity, community, and excellence, but also some guiding principles that we heard uh, my inauguration speech, uh, speech. I talked a lot about the importance of always remaining curious and always creating knowledge, but also the importance of being courageous and taking risks and making decisions that perhaps may not be popular may not be popular, but are important to move our university to that next level. And making sure we remain a place that we care about our students, and students feel loved and cared for. And every time we have visitors come, uh, whether we're recruiting faculty, they always comment, oh, boy, people here are so nice. There's just something about the people on campus, the culture on campus. And even as we aspire to move the university forward, we can't lose that culture of care because I think it is something that um, uh, distinguishes us from all these other universities. And, and obviously, we may uh, committed to the important of diversity that we can do. So I will end with um, this is a slide that I, that I put many places on the website in terms of our aspirations and vision for the university. Uh, I'm excited about where we're taking the university. Uh, I'm excited about the energy that I'm sensing on campus uh, for this change. Uh, and I'm going to need everybody in this room's help, all of our alumni's help, to really uh, achieve the ambitious goals for the university. Uh, it is truly an exciting time. Paula and I, I like Paula here, many of you met, 
Um, we are truly honored to be in this role and, and to meet so many people from the city of Houston. We thought Atlanta was a welcome city. <laughs> Atlanta is nothing like Houston. People here are so wonderful, <laughs> and we feel so honored to be in this position. Thank you. Questions, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say is the greatest challenge that, that, that Rice University faces now? That's a great question. So um, I'll pose it in two different ways. I think many universities are faced with the increasing mental health challenges that our undergraduate students are facing. And this is something that, despite the fact that we have this culture of care, despite the fact that we're small and we get to do some things that others can't, we still are seeing a dramatic uh, increase in um, mental health challenges among our students, something in the range of 300% uh, before COVID to now. And so figuring out how we handle that, how we create an environment where we don't have some of the stresses that we have is one of the challenges. I think Rice's broad challenge is just with, we're small, and how do we overcome our size to have a huge impact is, is a big challenge. We're growing, but we're still going to be a fraction of the size of other places. And uh, how do we have the impact that we want? And that's why I talk a lot about these partnerships and partnering with others, because we have to do that, because we just don't have the critical mass that we need to Yes. Um, how how big? What is your goal for size? What is your goal for size? I'm very careful. So we're going to get to 4,800. That's been approved by the trustees. That's out there. Um, so I'll be I'm cautious not to say what size we should be. Let me tell you what size our peers are. So if you look at the Ivy Leagues and the Ivy Plus, right? So the Ivy League schools plus say Duke, Northwestern, U Chicago, Wash U. So Caltech out there, we only have 900 students. Um, those schools average close to 7,000. So even at 4,800, we're going to be small as a university. You know, our, our challenge is we're remaining remain committed, I remain committed to the college system and housing roughly 75% of our students on campus. So for every uh, 400 students, we need a new college. So we're building two new colleges now to accommodate the 800 growth. So if you think about getting to 6,000, we're talking three more colleges after the two now. And so um, <coughs> we'll see how 4,800 we'll 4, feels and make sure we can accommodate that. And then we'll, we'll reassess. We'll reassess. I was looking at me. <laughs> we'll reassess after that to see if, if uh, my sense is at some point we're going to continue to grow. Everybody's growing. Darcy's is growing. Um, and it's about having an impact and, and being accessible. And we need to figure out how to do that and balance the culture that we're which I think has to be. Yes, the infrastructure has to be there, not just the physical infrastructure, but the faculty are always reminded, well, as we're growing the faculty, we need more TAs and we need more staff. And so it's not just the physical infrastructure, it's everything else that goes with it. So it's absolutely that's correct. So we have to be careful to not just grow the student body and the faculty, but make sure we have all the support services to, to um, handle the growth. Yes, Rick, uh, Richie, can you say a little bit about the Rice Endowment and what your fundraising plans are? I mean, these are big plans. Uh, you yeah. must have some, uh, some, a lot of thought on that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's obviously uh, the endowment is somewhere around 7.8 uh, billion. One of the challenges Rice has, it's a challenge, and some, some presidents say it's a good problem to have, but we are heavily dependent on the endowment, unlike any other university other than Princeton. Princeton is extremely heavily dependent on the endowment, but they have. 40 or 50 billion, so it's easier to be dependent when you have that much. But our challenge is something in the range of 40% of our operating comes from uh, our endowment, uh, which is, is, you know, it's, it's heavy. Uh, we heavily discount tuition, right? So this is something where Rice is committed to. We're not free anymore, but we, we do 65% discount tuition, which means that our actual average tuition is around 60% lower than what we put down, and we have the lowest tuition amongst any of our private peers by a pretty significant margin. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so we are heavily dependent on endowment, so it's going to be important that 
If we continue to grow the endowment, it's going to be important that we continue to uh, raise funds. We are uh, in our quiet phase of a campaign. We're not sure where we're going to end up in terms of the amount of the campaign. Uh, we'll probably have an official launch sometime in the fall. I think we have a question. Now. Yes. Early in the tenure of your predecessor, um, Mr. Lipron spent much time trying to merge with one of the medical institutions, particularly um, Baylor, and he received much dissension from members of the faculty. What are your thoughts about the possibility of that? That's a question fraught with problems there. Especially <laughs> <laughs> I have my colleagues from Baylor there to speak to their many others here. Um, that's, that's probably not, my sense is that's probably not going to happen. Now, yeah. um, I think short of that, we need to figure out. I, there's no doubt not having a medical school uh, harms us in, from a visibility perspective. Certainly, from a research, if you look at our research enterprise, it's a fraction of our peers because we don't have a medical school. Um, I don't think this is something I'm going to pursue in the near future. That being said, we need to figure out how we leverage being across the street from one of the best medical schools in Baylor, one of the best hospital systems in, in Methodist. One of the best places for cancer in Indiana State and, and others in you know, Texas Children's. We need to figure out how we take that to the next level. So this is what I'm focused on. What, what are the relationships? What's the structure we can create? Can we create something like a Broad Institute, like they have in Boston, here at Houston, anchored by Rice, working with the institutions there? So I don't think that's something that, that is going to be on the, on the docket in the near future. Um, but we need to figure out how we grow that space, just because we have so much interest and so much opportunity to they don't. No, that's, what, that's exactly right. Princeton doesn't have a medical school, um, but the vast majority of them do, right? Uh, and so you're right. Princeton doesn't have a medical school. They don't have a law school or a business school. At least we have a business school. <laughs> um, but Princeton is, is a, it's a unique place. I mean, it, it, it clearly, if you look at that, that ranking I did for graduate programs, every one of their programs in the humanities are in the top 10, right? In the social sciences are. So it's a different place, and it's it's um, you know obviously having the level of endowment they have provides them with some opportunities that we don't have, and they don't have a lot. You know they have six thousand, I think we're at like fifty eight hundred, so they're not that much bigger than we are. Uh, so yes, yes, I get it. <laughs> so you mentioned partnerships earlier, and I noticed the top left of the slide was a picture of downtown Houston where the ION is located. I'm a great fan of the ION. I spend a fair amount of time there, and I'm wondering what Rice is going to do to increase its presence in the ION in, in that district. What are your plans? Yeah, so I'm sure everybody's familiar with the ION. Uh, the ION building is the first of uh, the buildings that will be in the ION district. So the district itself is around 14 acres, but we have quite a bit of land there. Uh, right now, the ION buildings are around 80% full, and there are several anchor tenants, Microsoft, Chevron, Technology Ventures, and a lot of smaller, smaller entities there. Uh, we are just in the process of creating space for Rice University, around 8,000 square feet, a combination of our Office of Innovation, which is new, so we created an Office of Innovation primarily focused on helping our faculty take their research and discoveries and commercialize them. So we'll put our business school students with our uh, engineering faculty and science faculty and other faculty that have discoveries to begin that process of really uh, trying to commercialize some of the work we're doing and really just creating a culture around the city of Houston, around entrepreneurship. A lot of it will be focused on clean tech. Uh, I think Houston is truly poised to be the, the energy transition capital of the world. I think Rice needs to help drive that. We are absolutely, there's no reason Right now, it's MIT and Stanford. And I think uh, there's no reason Rice can't be as strong in this space given where we are, the partners we can have here, the physical assets of the city of Houston, we can really help drive this change. So, yeah, so the Ion District is something we're committed to, figuring out how to catalyze it. I was at Georgia Tech for many years before here, and, and when I first got there, they, they created their Ion District, it's called Tech Square. It took about 15 years. And that place is unbelievable now. At first, it was the, the last place you would go. You wouldn't want to walk through there. It was very dangerous. And now you couldn't even get you couldn't even get an apartment there. It's transformed the midtown area of Atlanta. And I'm convinced it's going to happen. 
to be accurate. And we're telling people this is going to take. This is not going to happen overnight. This is going to take. It's going to take a decade to really fully catalyze that record. So I think the potential is significant. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I belong to Baylor and to Harris County Hospital District, and I sit on four boards in the medical center. Uh, I don't have a question, maybe, but I do have an observation. Uh, I'm aware of seven institutions in the medical center that have nearing double-digit billion uh, strategic plans for the next 10 years, and I've seen a bunch of them, and they're almost identical. And the world's largest concentration of mass raw ego is in the incestuous nepotistic boards of these institutions <laughs> and they have money and they're all going to be asked to give billions of dollars to these almost identical strategic plans so an engineering option and opportunity is somehow to get the ceos and the chair of the boards in the same room lock the door and figure out how we do this together and the next 10 years are going to bring about absolutely fantastic alliances. We already have innumerable alliances in, in research, education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll not type a question on that, but I think all of those boards and all of those CEOs need to come together because they don't want to talk to each other. And if we talk to each other, the sky is the limit. And, uh, I really appreciate your talk. I was on the 50 yard line when John Kennedy made his famous speech at the, at the stadium uh, as a freshman and sophomore medical student. And those were exciting times. I, I agree. We can, we can make those same I, things. I agree 100%. I think working together is going to be key. We have a, a ways to go. And just to give you one data point Johns Hopkins University does more NIH funding than the entire Texas Medical Center and the other colleges in Houston combined. Oh, wow. And I just went, just to give you a sense of, I think, how much further we can go, and we have to go. But you're right, all the CEOs have to come together and figure out how can we work together to really elevate the health sciences. The new director of NIH and the position has two people on the list. One of those has strong, strong alliances to uh, this region of the world. I'm aware of that. As we look from the graduate program, but at the same time, we have the undergraduate program, but with the goal of the graduate program, perhaps the largest of the undergraduate program, where do you see the most promise in uh, the undergraduate, uh, excuse me, the graduate program? Students. That's hard to say when I, where I see the most promise. You know, I think the way and people, this is a question I get from all, all set of my deans, is like, where are you going to invest your money and where, which departments are going to grow with their areas? And I say, ask the provost, because that's really a problem for the job. So I even defer to the provost. <laughs> um, what we need to do is really grow, in, and this is always a challenge that universities have. We need to grow in areas that aren't department specific that are cross-disciplinary, but you end up feeding departments because everybody eventually is housed in departments. So the process we're trying to go through now, which is always a challenge, is to say, let's pick some thematic areas. Energy and climate is one. How can we bring people together across the breadth of the university? Environmental justice and the humanities, or sciences and natural science and engineering, pull them all together to really solve this huge problem. So the departments will grow, but not by saying, I want to grow Journey history, or I want to grow this. We want to grow these thematic areas where rice can be known as the very best, and then naturally the products will get bigger. So I know I sort of skirted your answer because I'm getting pretty good at skirting the answer. Where, where is that where you want to go? But that's really the approach that we're trying to take is let's, let's think of the thematic areas where we can be known as great, and then where the faculty fall just depends on who can create the best talent. Well, thank you so much, thank you. Um, President Miller. That was really inspiring, and it 
actually kind of brings us back to the original purpose of the Houston Philosophical Society, which was about a partnership between Rice and the community and what we could do to serve the world, to serve Houston. And I don't know about everybody else, but I'm pretty sure I can speak for everyone in the room that we are behind you 100%. We want to see all of this happen and we want to, uh, you know, broadcast the effects or create a ripple effect throughout the rest of Houston to do, to be right behind you, to be part of, you know, uh, supporting Rice in making all of that happen. So thank you for a very inspirational speech. Thank you so much.